Sorry, I missed that. Um, okay, I have started um, the, yes. Okay, very nice. Um, yes, we're live now. <laughs> um, hello again, class. Um, and we're in the, our final set of interviews um, uh, with tutors of to get a bit of their wisdom and to get the class to know them a little little bit. Uh, now we have Shamin and Tianyu. Um, our head tutor, uh, David, is actually camera shy, so you wouldn't see him in this series. Um, so Shamin and Tianyu, welcome. Uh, as a star, I would invite you to introduce yourself a little to tell the class uh, what you're working on and say anything, something about yourself. Um, could, can you make a start? Okay, so hi uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Tianyu. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student. It's the fourth year that I'm in NU. So uh, I'm currently working on uh, intelligent agent and um, computer vision, and more specifically on 3D thing understandings. Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, Charmaine, what about you? Hi, I'm Charmaine. Um, I'm just about to finish the first year of my PhD, but I did my undergrad here, so this is probably my sixth year in here. Um, I'm working in computer vision. I haven't fully decided what my main focus for my PhD is, but so far it's been geared towards learning better representations for images. Thank you. Oh, great. We have two computer vision researchers <laughs> uh, in this this round. Um, so moving on, both of you have been essentially immersed in machine learning for a few years. Uh, what's your one favorite model? And can you tell people a little bit about it? Um, uh, I guess I will go first. OK, so um, my favorite model is variational inference. Uh, so for a couple of reasons, so I'll briefly talk about what variational inference is. So variational inference algorithm try to find a, a set of low dimensional variables that are capable of summarizing a, a, a high dimensional data. So in this sense, it's a type of a compression algorithm. And the reason that I like it is in real world data, set or in real world scenario, the data is always full of noise and that will influence your learning. And as I just described, variational inference try to find a try to compress a high dimensional data into a set of low dimensional variables. And you can understand this as a, a co compression process. To compression, it means you, you can rule out noise and so that's the reason that I like, that I like, love it. And I also work on computer vision. So image data is relatively high dimensional. For example, like uh, 1,000 times 1,000. And you never want to deal with data that in this high dimension. So variational inference can effectively compress it down to, let's say, just uh, 512 variables, which is really amazing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That's connected to the dimensionality reduction week that we'll have in the class, which is, I think, week six. <laughs> uh, what about you, Shami? Um, as Steve's student, I have to say DDNs, obviously. Uh, okay. from, the course, <laughs> yeah. from the course, it's probably the EM algorithm, um, mostly because it's the standard way of optimizing given latent variables. And I think there's lots of cool models that can be made by specifying different relationships between observed and latent variables. And EM can be used for lots of different, even ones that you don't specify latent variables specifically, but you can restructure a lot of algorithms as if it had a latent variable and then use EM. Oh, thanks. That's very cool. So EM and variational inference, well, literally has an inherent connection, right? Um, 
Mm. So you guys have been sort of connected. We will go over that. Um, and things you like, you're not allowed to mention uh, sort of jargon or acronym without explaining it. Now you have to tell the class what DDN are. <laughs> In a nutshell. <laughs> it uh, stands for Deep Declarative Networks. Um, the idea is within a uh, overall optimization, you can run uh, you can run internal optimizations that don't have to have classical gradient structures. So you can use classical algorithms, but as long as you define it in a kind of special way, you can still take gradients through it. So it really allows for these structured optimizations. Um, cut given example maybe say i don't know something like a facial recognition process maybe you're trying to detect faces your overall optimization is trying to be able to detect the best uh to detect whose face is what maybe an internal optimization would be finding specifically where the eyes and nose and mouth are with usual algorithms you can't really specify that the learning algorithm has to find those but with something like a ddn you can guide the algorithm to specifically learn those things as in inoptimization. That's very cool. Thanks, Charmaine. Um, well, DDN is one of the one example of the latest class of models, except this DDN is being developed by Steve Gould's group here at the AAU. The other related instances like include deep equilibrium models, uh, neural ODE, and uh, basically a collection of models that the community come up that optimizes what's called implicit functions as part of a neural network. And it can do lots of cool things all the way from filling in missing data to solving ODEs and PDEs at the scale that was previously not <laughs> possible. So that's really cool. OK, so grounding more on the class, what advice would you have for students who are starting out in statistical machine learning? And um, how, yeah, um, yeah, what pe should people take away <laughs> for doing well? Um, Shami, would you like to start? Uh, so this course specifically covers so much stuff. Uh, we cover most of this pretty large textbook, so there's lots of models to wrap your head around. And there's lots of maths involved with each of them. One of the best ways I think is really abstracting away all the maths and just trying to find out what the assumptions are and what the kind of story is behind each model. Even though the textbook is really terrible at going into the maths and lots of its derivations are missing and it delves too deep too quickly, at the start of each chapter is usually a pretty understandable story explained in English, which is really good to read. And the same thing goes for the lecture slides. It's going to be lots of just math equations written down or high level ideas. It's not useful to read those slides on its own. Watch the lecture videos and maybe skip the derivation part if you're not comfortable with that at the start, but at least listen to what is the ideas behind each model at the start and what's trying to be accomplished and get an intuitive idea for that. Thanks a lot. Um, sound advice, I mean, can you work out yours? Um, so my advice is that, um, so as Shaman just mentioned, that there are a lot of stuff in this course and a lot of mathematics. So it is kind of impossible for lecturers to cover everything during the lectures. So my advice is you can treat the lectures as a as a highlight of the important content but but after the lecture you need to go back to the book read through the book and then try to understand it yourself right so i know that there are other courses where it's enough to just listen to the lectures but this course this is definitely not the case so you need to read the book yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Tian. Um, right, both of you alluded to the breadth um, of machine learning content, and what we can cover in the whole semester is also sort of a only part of what what's commonly considered foundational machine learning. Um, yes, and 
at the level of a third or fourth year course, the lecture, I think Tian is very much right, that le lectures are highlights. So in this year, where the changes we introduce are we're going to keep the contents um, the same, um, the lecture recordings are from previous years, and we'll use lecture time to sort of workshop with you in the format that we're currently in um, some of the stories and key content of a chapter. But yes, um, reading the textbooks and basically figuring out the right way for you to understand the concept is still quite important. Um, so zooming back out again for our last discussion. Um, so what do you think is one of the common misconceptions about machine learning, uh, whether it's um, for students or for society in general nowadays? Would um, can you wants to make a start? Yeah, okay. So um, almost everybody knows we're in a deep learning era. And also Chandler mentioned a bunch of really interesting deep learning techniques. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a miscon uh, like a misconception, conception, but um, I think many people have the question that why if deep learning is so powerful, then, then why we still need to learn this basic machine learning stuff, right? So I had the same question like uh, two years ago. Then I realized that, um, so the deep learning concept, it, the deep learning technique is really good at extract features in a way that respect the structure of the data, but the actual learning path is still handled or explainable by current machine learning techniques, for example, guided by the maximum likelihood principles, right? And so I would say that deep learning serves as a tool set for machine learning, right? Uh, also, so I can put it in this way, maybe in the futures, deep learning technique will be uh, obsolete, uh, replaced by something else, but machine learning will never be replaced by anything else. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you for the wisdom. Um, Shamin, do you have a point um, mm -hmm. <laughs> separate or something to add to that? Um, you mentioned also society in general. I think the media doesn't do a very good job of explaining uh, the scope at which breakthroughs slash uh, ability of models so far. For example, uh, something like, say, AlphaGo with its ability to beat humans, professional humans, straight out. Yes, there. It's so much more than a human could do and such uh, board strategies and stuff, but the scope, so many engineers on one problem and such limited scope for that algorithm, even though the general concept is, it's a general learning algorithm, it's still had so much bells and whistles specifically for that task being put in. We are still not very close to a general learning algorithm in any sense. I think that hasn't really been shown well by the media. That's probably the only misconception comes to the top of my head. Oh, yeah, thank you both for that. These are really good points. And yeah, throughout this, um, I guess, this chat series today, um, people really kind of covered a diverse set of um, different issues. I, I resonate deeply with what you guys just said. Um, basically, despite deep learning is the key word that the media and many uh, members of the public know about. The foundational ideas, um, I would say most of them exist. They just have not been put together in this particular way. And sometimes it takes a um, fundamental idea, like more than 20 years or 20, 30 years to get into practice or wide use. For example, I was recently looking back at the material of um, why deep neural networks are powerful. Right, uh, as of, opposed to shallow and wide. The initial paper um, I found actually was uh, Ben Gio's um, survey papers that cited Andrew Yao's um, FOCS paper in the 1980s that first said in the logical gates, um, yeah, you need a combinatorial 
a number of units to represent parity check, and that was the proof. Um, and right, so and then it propagated on from there, right? If people are interested in foundational theoretical CS, their work might show up in, um, say, trendy models 20 years later, and that's very important. Um, yeah, about the the media, right? Yeah, the, the the misconceptions generalizing from saying things like AlphaGo to say terminators for humanity is a big stretch. Um, in the other interview, Alex Sohan also raised the same point, right? So uh, being able to play Go does not itself play like pose existential threat to humanity. And um, people need to basically understand a bit more of machine learning to know that. Um, and hopefully people in the class after learning the class will fully appreciate this point. Um, well, thank you so much um, for your answers and for appearing in the interview. I hope the videos show up well. I'm not gonna now gonna stop the streaming. Just bear me bear with me for 20 seconds, which I hope will suffice. Okay. Right, so it's